Hey everybody, how's it going? I am, as ever, Alistair, and welcome to the Wednesday Night Stream, where, in a little bit, we will be continuing with A Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking by Ursula, which is getting to very, very big stuff. Literally, as we'll find out. Ten feet to my immediate left is the amazing Marguerite, who will be producing the show today. Hi! And is also in the chat. Uh, the unbelievably good fan art we saw at the top is not from the usual subject matter we deal with. That is fan art from Rec Runner, which is the virtual race produced for the Zombies Run platform that myself and Mer Lafferty co-wrote earlier in the year. Rec Runner remains one of the most fun projects I've ever worked on. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Zombies Run, it is basically a fitness app that tricks you into thinking it's an audio drama. And it works. <coughs> and what we did was they were they had commissioned a lot of alternate worlds for it and we successfully sold one which was the idea being you are part of a team of uh, search and rescue astronauts going into wrecked or dying spaceships and pulling people out it was so much fun to do and the recording and production on it is so unbelievably great it honestly blew me away and that is fan art of something which came from our brains, from the amazing art of MRSTJ. And I was just made my day seeing that there. It was really, really cool, and I wanted to share it with you. And speaking, as we were, of Mer Lafferty, uh, we have the first in a stream, a veritable stream, of special guests tonight. Both Mer and Divya, who are the editors for Escape Pod, the science fiction um, podcast anthology show that Marguerite and I co own, are on the show tonight to uh, read the opening monologue and chat about the 15th anniversary of Escape Pod and also um, about the anthology that's just come out to commemorate that. And now, through the magic of buttons, I can introduce them. Hello, folks, how are you? Hey. I have done. Okay, great. Good. How are you? Uh, pretty good. Thank you so much for coming on the show. My understanding is we are your second stop on, on the, the epic media press tour today. <laughs> you are. Yeah. Fantastic. We spoke to uh, Forbidden Planet TV a couple of hours ago. Excellent. How did that, that go? How did it go? It was fun. Short and sweet. Yeah. Fantastic. So, um... What we're going to do is, if you could read the opening monologue we sent you, and then we'll have a chat about the book, and your books, and other things that are book-related. Sounds good. Mary, you, uh, you want to go first, or shall I? I'll go first. All right. Pink spacesuits, blue spacesuits, by Alistair Stewart. He's right there. There are three trailers that have hit, basically back-to-back, -back, for astronaut shows or movies. Let's talk about what they tell us about the current state of near future, near space, science fiction. Full disclosure, this is a field I'm pretty invested in right now for just over 65,000 reasons, and it's one I've been fond of all my life, which is why LEGO is going to get even more of my money this year. And y'all can't follow that link, but it links to the Mars Research Shuttle on LEGO. Which I got. Which you own now. Which I now own. What I find most immediately attention-grabbing here is that the past is a safe place. For all mankind basks in the romantic afterglow of the Apollo program, even as it posits a world where it came in second. It's an immensely savvy move, taking the ultimate American engineering achievement and doing the only thing that makes it even more of an underdog, having it lose. That leads to the subversive, fun elements we glimpsed there. I'm pretty certain those female astronauts will turn out to be some variant of the Mercury 13. I'm also pretty sure we see a glimpse of Major Robert Lawrence. The space program, always a stalking horse for America's self-image, re-imaged through adversity as something better. It's an incredibly compelling idea, and a surprisingly easy sell, given its alternate history based around something still in living memory. Plus, it does look fun as hell. Then we get to Ad Astra, and things somehow get both weirder and duller. Like I said further up, this looks for all the world like Heart of Darkness in Space. And while that's fun, lunar rover chases, it's also apparently got an emotional core that seems like the lowest of low-hanging fruit. 
It's, it's early days and there's clearly lots to come, but right now it looks a lot like handsome, brave, amazing astronaut risks all to save solar system from improbably evil father. Which, when the improbably evil father has a lightsaber, is fine. When it looks worryingly like he's got, got in the eyeliner, done a bad job of it, and watched blown away on repeat, there's cause for concern. Here we go again, as White Snake once sort of put it. If that puts an earworm in my head, Alistair, I am going to kill you. Going down the only road male characters in movies ever seem to get, as they didn't once put, as, as they didn't once put it all, put it at all. That brings us to Lucy in the Sky. Loosely based on a true story and the directorial debut of Noah Hawley, who does not know how to frame an image badly. It looks amazing. It also looks to tackle, head on, the issue every astronaut has faced to some extent. What happens when the mission is over? This has been an issue as long as we've sent people into space, with the sheer profundity of the experience defining the lives of those that go. When astronauts were test pilots, it was especially difficult because when you've reached the top of the pyramid, what do you do? What happens when you have nothing more to win? I'm honestly really excited to see this idea explored and especially explored through a female lens. I'm willing to bet you'll be able to put this and Interstellar side by side and see some fascinatingly different perspectives on certain beats. And yet, it is also a movie about a woman being too emotional to deal with space. Each one of these projects looks brilliant. Each one of these projects has a downside. For all mankind could so easily slip into jingoistic fan fiction. Ad Astra could have an utterly pat emotional core. Lucy in the Sky could just be about a woman who fell apart under the strain of her job. I doubt and hope that's the case, but I feel like... When you view them all like this, it shows their strengths and weaknesses, as well as giving us a read on the current state of the subgenre. From where I'm sitting, it's good news. The near future, near space SF is evolving, trying new things, and old things and new wrappers, and moving towards something very different. After all, books have already got there, so it's about time TV and movies caught up. Okay. Thank you very much for doing that. I really appreciate it. And I would also like to present a written apology to myself from 2019, who had yet to see Ad Astra and had no idea what was coming. <laughs> That's the only one of those three I've actually seen. Yeah, the other so, two uh, sound more interesting. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you like I, have witnessed the dubious, the, the, the dubious glory of Brad Pitt versus a baboon in Zero Gravity. What? Oh, man. Yes. That whole movie. It, it's, just, I have not seen this. Do not, under <laughs> any circumstances, wow. hurry. Was it, in fact... Uh... It's it's Heart of Darkness in Space. Okay. It, it's Brad's really sad, no, y'all. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it's don't, just... Don't bother. Mm -mm, mm -mm. I, I, I thought it was going to be cool and art housey and maybe like David Lynch in space, but no, not so much. No, it's, 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 most, it's mostly just Brad Pitt looking like this. For like two hours. Yeah. <laughs> the chat, however, seems very excited about the idea of a uh, part of darkness in space. It does I'm, I'm, I'm quite surprised we haven't had a baboons. Yeah, <laughs> give, I, I, I give it maybe maybe to thirty seconds. So thank you so much for reading that, and thank you so much for coming on the show, uh, and also for the ridiculously great work you do because you two are the senior editors at Escape Pod, which is our longest serving podcast. Fifteen years. Fifteen years and. Ooh. Woo! And to celebrate those 15 years, Escape Pod is going to one place podcasts almost never go to print. Right. This very <laughs> freaking week, the Escape Pod anthology is seeing print in the UK. And the reason it's not seeing print in the US will tickle me forever, and we'll get to that in a moment. But could you talk a little bit about how it came together and what kind of stories you've got in there for us? Yes. Want me to start? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, the Escape Pod anthology came together as a kind of celebration of our 15 years. We trying to do our best to please our existing fan base as well as hopefully bring in new fans who 
maybe don't do this shiny new podcast thing that's only been it, around since 2014 or years. yeah of course yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, so we, we tried to we tried to mix it up uh, with some old stuff, with some new stories, with a whole bunch of authors from throughout our many many years of podcasting, and uh, and bring something that is uh, hopefully commemorative and celebrative. Fantastic. Um, well, how we came about stories is. Um, you know, looking at the authors and looking what they have or what we, we, the ones we think could make really awesome, fun stories and had had a tie to the show and looking for reprints from people who um, also have a tie to the show and perhaps started when they were in a much different place in their career, say before they got the MacArthur Grant. And um, (laughs) now they are doing much bigger things than our little podcast, but we still like to remind people that uh, we've had a wide variety of people at various stages in their career. So we've got some new people and some established people and uh, really, really proud of what we've put together because we pretty much accomplished everything we set out to do with it. Yeah, Yeah, you did. I feel like we did. Yeah. It, it, it's a, I, I remember very few disappointments along the way. Which, yeah, which should absolutely be a pull quote on the poster. <laughs> um, no, you, you folks did, did, did an incredible job. It's a brilliant cross-section of 15 years of escape on science fiction. And, um, yeah, it speaks very strongly to your editorial voice on the show as well because of how enthusiastic it is and how wide band it is and I, the, the thing which I, I really loved when I saw the table of contents was I, I knew instinctively the moment I saw it if I didn't know that you two had put it together I'd be like this is a Murr and Divya book <laughs> <laughs> um, sure sure could you talk a little bit about how you work together and what being part of an editorial team means I think I took this question last time all right. Um, uh, to me, it means uh, having a partnership. And so, I don't know, Murr and I work together really well. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really short version. And that's fantastic. It's, it's turned into uh, a friendship, a uh, partnership. We collaborate on most aspects of the podcast, especially in terms of choosing stories. We generally touch base about once a month and review all the short fiction that's come through that's been recommended by our other staff. And we argue about it, except that we rarely argue. <laughs> um, and then there's just arm wrestling, and, you said, right? Uh, yeah, once in a while we have to do sort of a virtual arm wrestle, but it's very rare. And we, um, we go from there. And I think one of one of my favorite parts is just having someone to squee over great things with. You know, when when a really good story comes by that we both love, or when we got our first Hugo nomination, you know, it's nice to have someone to call up and, and run out of the office building and start screaming. Of course. <laughs> um, and if if I, one of us was, well, at least speaking for myself, if I were editing Escape Bot alone, that would not be a, a joy I would get to share. And thank you very much for, for mentioning that because Mer and Divya have now been, along with their intrepid uh, associate editor, Ben, who um, in my mind is Ken Kinney, action science correspondent for the TV, the local <laughs> TV show that we run. I, I really should get around to writing that sitcom. Um, the tagline is, so Ken, we gonna live? Maybe. Cool. Now sports. Uh, <laughs> you are, have now been nominated twice for the best semi prosine Hugo, which is unbelievably cool, and I think speaks to just how great you are at your job. So thank you very much for literally everything you do, because it's amazing. Um, I'm curious, and I'm, I'm also having a weird moment of performance anxiety coming in immediately after Forbidden Planet TV, and trying very hard not to ask the questions they would. Um, <laughs> what 
obviously with with you being in kind of editorial positions means that you, you get the stuff which filters through the slush system to you which also you know means you get a still get a pretty widespread view of the industry what trends if anything are you seeing at this stage in 2020 the year where march never ends uh, is is there a massive uptick in viral sf is there a massive uptick in hopeful stuff is it all grim or are there no real patterns emerging there are grimmer things it's it's i don't see a, a a topic trending but what we're getting is grimmer than usual okay. it's not all virus or all world on fire but it's just you know sometimes when i when i read through i think i have just had a bad day and that's why i don't really like any of these stories but, you know, in our last meeting, we're talking and we're like, did none of these really turn you on? And no, it's just they're all kind of, you know, it's it's not even that some of them were good, but they don't fit the tone of Escape Pod. And it's, uh, so yeah, things have been grimmer lately. And that's kind of sad for a magazine that was founded on the idea of having fun. It, it is the... Yeah, I feel like there's a trend... Uh... I feel like we're seeing more examinations of corporate and capitalist dystopias. Yes. Good point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's not a trend trend so much as just there's a higher volume of those compared to like not as many space stories, for example. <laughs> um, there's like, yeah, a lot more, you know, sort of introspective examinations of our reality rather than, uh, adventurous um, out there kind of stuff. And the thing is, you can sell us a story about corporate dystopia. It's it's not out of the question, but we're just getting a lot of it right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The chat's so talking about uh, Chat's talking about Wodehouse sci-fi and how they would like to see Jeeves in space. <gasps> oh, Jeeves in space! Oh my god. <laughs> Wodehouse sci-fi. I claimed. I want it. I want it. <laughs> you heard it here first. Oh, Get writing. Uh, which yeah, I, I feel like someone should have done that already, but I can't I think of anything off the top of my head. The closest thing I've ever seen, and, and this is one of those things, much like the Armageddon toys, which I should have bought the day the movie came out and then sold for a profit the following week when the movie stopped playing. Um <laughs> I, I saw I, I when I was a comic retailer, I saw this incredible indie comic that looked wonderful. It was called Scream for Jeeves, and it was all done in black silhouette art print. And the front cover was just a Bertie Woodhouse figure sitting down at his table, recoiling in horror as his butler lifts a cloche which has tentacles hurtling out from under it. Love it. And wow. and I have looked for Scream for Jeeves in every second-hand bookstore I've been in on, and on every site. And I'm increasingly convinced it was a hallucination because I've never seen it again. <laughs> well, oh, no, now, no, no. Basically, ha folks in the chat are saying they remember it. Fantastic. So now we need to find oh. a copy of Scream for Scream Jeeves. Scream for Jeeves. Thank, the, the, the internet yeah. is, is working its magic tonight. Fantastic. So with that being what you're seeing at the moment, what is there you would like to see? Or what surprises you? Which is an awful question. It's like, oh, I, this was completely unexpected. I must make a note of this to remember the next time someone asks me. But, you know. <laughs> no, no. It's, it's, it's valid. Um, I always like funny stories. Humor's hard. And we don't, we don't, we don't want to be a comedy magazine. That's not our goal. But, you know, we do pu publish funny things, you know, when they impress us. And uh, humor's really tough so when i come across a, a funny story i get very excited so uh humor and Wodehouse sf is a new passion of mine <laughs> uh, I, about it recently. I would like to say that um I, even though i just found it i've not found a whole lot of examples of it so i would like to see something like that brilliant <laughs> yeah i think uh, uh i think I feel like I could also use some escapist science fiction right now. I mean, Grim and Dark has its place and, and deep, thoughtful examinations of social problems also have their place, but that place is like outside my house right now. And I think 
internally, I would like to see things get a little bit more mixed up. And I don't know if if this is just coincidence that we're seeing more of this in flesh, or if people are just processing uh, life in their fiction, as authors often do, and that's why we're seeing more of it. In which case, it might be hard for them to write fun escapist stuff. But personally, in my uh, with my writer's hat on, as opposed to my editor's hat on, I was really, really grateful to be working on something that was far in the future and very fantastical and had absolutely no relevance to any reality whatsoever these past few months. Yes. And so I think maybe I'm looking for a little bit more of that in Flush, too. I, I saw a comic strip many years ago um, about two women talking, and one's like, um, she says, I have to work late tonight. Then she gets on her phone with her boyfriend. She's like, yeah, I'm seeing another man. And she hangs up, and her girlfriend's like, why did you do that? And she's like, oh, he'd rather uh, have something he could punch. And I get that feeling now of if you give me corporate sci-fi, there's not a lot of action that could get me out of the horribleness yep. of that dystopia while – I'm not saying just distill it down to punching, but, you know, it is nice to have a story where you punch something and you win. <laughs> and and, and I bonus mean, points for Nazis. Yep, yep, yep. Years and years ago, a friend of mine t- coined the term resolution. Where he said, when he, yeah. he when he realized that, that one of his favorite types of story was the type which was resolved with the main character and the villain wrestling on a bridge, preferably one that's on fire. And, nice. and yes, simultaneously in the rain and on fire. Simultaneously in the rain and on fire. There we go. So yeah, I'm. I'm that would be another story I'd like to see. <laughs> I, 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 we are both right there with you. I mean, we are most of the way through the BBC show Hustle which is basically leverage with Cockney accents in a lot of ways. And um, it's perfect escapism because here's an evil, here's an evil rich guy that doesn't care about ever, ever, anybody. He has no money now and has been humiliated. That's every episode. And now we're going to drink champagne and buy fabulous clothes. And, and, and it just, it, it, it's, it's so cathartic because it doesn't happen. But here, here on TV for 45 minutes, it will, you know, and it, it's, I, I I share your desperate need for escapism completely. Thank you. And as is always, because the... I have a preteen, uh, I've been watching Kipo and the Wonder Beasts on Netflix. Is that good? Is that? What's that? <laughs> I said I have a teen, and we watch that. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. We watched the first two seasons, and then we're now we're we're rewatching them and. and catching up with season three because that's what we do we did the same thing with Carmen San Diego but like all these kids shows um are just it's like that is the place I want to be you know middle grade fiction yep where uh there's not even really terrible bad guys in any of these right like there's misguided people the modern ethos of storytelling and our protagonists come in and get to save the day. And I'm like, yeah, I, I think I need more fiction that's where you can actually save the day. <laughs> there, there's a two-book series with a possible third one on the way, which are called uh, Sal and Gabby Break the Universe and Sal and Gabby oh, Fix the oh, yeah. Universe. And I've completely forgotten the author's name, and I feel terrible because he's lovely. But they are exactly that thing. In, in that they are semi-utopian science fiction, very kind of middle-grade facing. Um but also really funny. The The second one has, as a major character, an artificially intelligent toilet who who is... Nice. It's uh, Carlos Hernandez. Car- that's it, Carlos. Carlos is such a cool guy, and they're, they're lovely, lovely books. And, and, you know, like I say, there is this AI toilet, which every joke about it, an AI toilet is made, but is also one of the moral compasses of the book, and is just really cool. So, I feel like the AI toilet and Bob the Sourdough Starter would get along. I, yeah, I, I agree completely. <laughs> so, you also cunningly mentioned something which I wanted to come, come on to, which is you are not just editors for escape artists. You are both fiercely talented authors in your own right. Could you talk to us a little bit about what you're working on at the moment? You go, Mark. Okay, um, I have a book with Ace that's with my editor right now. Um, the working title is Midsolar Murders, and uh, it is so essentially um, Murder She Wrote Meets Babylon 5, where I hang a lantern on the fact that 
wow, murders happen around you a lot. Why is that? And I'm going to stay away from you because you're really scary because murders happen around you a lot, which no one ever seems to say in those shows. So I hang a lantern on that. Person wants to get away from humanity, so she goes to a diplomatic space station that's only got aliens on it. So she thinks. And hilarity and death ensue. Yes, both. Yes. I... I, (laughs) I have read a, a, a chunk of an early draft of this, and it is very good. Thank you, Alan. Uh, all right, so uh, I am currently in the final, final stages of my first ever novel, which is Woo. very exciting, Yay. called Machinehood. And Machinehood will be out in March. Um, my funny story with Machinehood is the, the pain of last week, <laughs> which I was telling Al about before we, we went live. Um, so the advanced reader copies of my book have already gone out, uh, so that people can review it. It's on NetGalley, all to the good. The, the casual reader, uh, will maybe pick up on some typos. They are, they are in there. Um, but as the book has gotten proofread by multiple people, some of whom have been very, very careful, uh, one of them pointed out a, an inconsistency in the timeline where two different chapters happen simultaneously to the same character at the same time on the same day, which is physically impossible. There is no time travel involved. So I have had the joy of um, being a very clever author and trying to (laughs) retcon my own book (laughs) in ways to basically untangle this particular knot and make sure that my timeline is consistent without any time travel (laughs) shenanigans going on. That's been good. And then... Uh, in parallel to this effort, I've started drafting a whole new novel that is very, very far future that has been my, my solace and my escape from, from the pandemic. Whereas Machinehood is very, very grounded. It's set in 2095. It's not super immediate, but uh, it's very realistic, near future thriller. And uh, I think they are billing it as Homeland meets Zero Dark Thirty. So I might say Terminator meets Zero Dark Thirty. I think Terminator yeah. meets Zero Dark Thirty is a better sell. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when's that due out? It is coming out March 2nd. Fantastic. You can pre-order it now. Yahoo! Fantastic. And Mer, when is your... Did you have a release date for your, your next one yet? Or not quite? You need to hydrate. No, no, no release date yet. It's... Uh... It, it needed a big rewrite, and then the pandemic hit, and I changed editors, and it was kind of a perfect storm. So they're just like, I could easily freak out about this, but I don't think it's necessary to freak out. My agent's not freaking out, but they're basically mm-hmm. like, how about we take it off the schedule, you give it a rewrite, we'll, we'll figure it out and put it back on the schedule when you're done. And then the pandemic hit, <laughs> and so it's been a weird year of rewriting a book that I don't know when it's going to come out. But um, I'm satisfied with the latest rewrite. I'm really happy with it. So Excellent. I'm hoping to hear from my editor sometime soon. We have resolution calligraphy already. The, this is the magnificent thing about this chat. It spontaneously generates art. It, it's brilliant. Also, um, Emma, who did the wonderful uh, opening art that we did, has just put together that I played Peter Lucas on the show. <laughs> And uh, I'm I'm so happy that that you're delighted by that because I am too. I, it was really fun, and I'm and thank you again for the amazing fan art. So, escape the escape pod anthology is out now in the UK, and the uh, US release date is November seventeenth. And the reason for this difference is officially one of my favorite ever things. Okay, so President Obama's first book. Second book? It's the first. The it's the first volume of his time in office. You know, it's it's, you know, a storm of sorts, not any of the others. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. Now you've yeah. killed Burr. <laughs> I, I, I. Oh God. Oh, <laughs> God. Oh, sorry. Um, is in fact humongous. It's apparently about eight hundred and fifty pages. And as a result of this, and as a result of the demand for it, basically every printing press in Europe is occupied. There is an entire tanker 
And this is surely an action movie waiting to happen, full of shipping containers, we have been told, full of copies of, of his book. And every other book has been knocked down the schedule. And ours is one of the ones that has been knocked down the schedule. This has happened to almost every yeah. UK author we know or publisher. All of them have said, there's a printing shortage. All of our books have been delayed. Thanks, Obama. We, the, the entire publishing industry has the one legitimate thanks, Obama, you could, you could go for. I'm so happy. It, it, it's like that unexpected Christmas present. It's like, it, I, it, I feel complete. Yes, I did want socks. Thank you. <coughs> so the the but, but if it's all the printing presses in Europe, why do you guys get the anthology before we do? I thought there was a problem in the U.S., which is why our version was cut back. I, I have no idea. Mm, I may have that backwards. Oh, oh. Is, it all, is it all printed over there because it's tightened? I think it may. Well, all... I'm wondering if it's all getting printed over there and shipped to us because yeah. yeah, they the the sort of implication i got was that it was shipping delays to the u.s from right 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 sorry likewise um 13 stories the the uh debut novel from one of the from the creator of the magnus archives uh, Jonathan Sims, or as he is known on Twitch, Johnny Big Streams, is also delayed in the US for similar reasons. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's a lovely problem to have. And, and I, I feel strangely amused by it, you know? And it just means that we'll arrive a little bit later in the US. And someone else will claim yeah. they invented the anthology years before we did. Oh, God. That, the, printing, a... <laughs> the print publishing industry, I don't know much about it, honestly, but it, it does seem a little odd that it has not globalize the way other things have like you would think all the books are printed you know in a handful of giant print shops somewhere in the world and then distributed to wherever in whichever edition of publisher has rights to that particular copy of that book not that they're actually physically printed in the uk Ex exactly by a shipping container to the u.s which seems really inefficient and strange um <laughs> acme, way to do anything in 2020 <laughs> acme book printing we print books all of them yeah you well, know. Well, the, why not one of the facts we learned um april-ish right when when lockdown started officially in the uk and when the first supply shortages started one of the things that first was a shortage was flour and the reason wasn't that there wasn't any flour to buy. It's that there was only two companies in the UK who printed the food safe packaging for flour. And they were completely overwhelmed and had no supplies. And that's why you were literally getting flour de delivered in like, normally it's sold in two to five kilo bags. It was sold in one kilo plastic bags. For a while, that's all you could get. And, and we have legit sacks of it. Yeah, we, we went to bakery supply folks and got 16 kilo bags of flour because we make a lot of bread these days. Which reminds me... Perfect. You're welcome for the segue. Perfect segue, thank you. You're welcome. For those of you worried, Chungus is doing fine. Okay, you have to explain this I'm, to I'm, I'm, I must explain this to our guests who even now are looking at me like... What? Alistair, you're holding a jar um, in front of a camera. What are you doing? <laughs> this is Chungus. This is our sourdough starter. Uh, he was born on the 20th of June, and we showed him off on the chat because we were really impressed. Then stuff like this started to happen. Chungus now has an entire... Chungus has a wardrobe. A wardrobe. Like, I'm not... He, he has costumes. There is a beard. There's a vampire cape. He has, f like, fan stickers... The whole nine yards. He, he has a little vampire costume and a little pumpkin hat, and he's very popular. And there is a feral, sentient sourdough starter in Ursula's book called Bob. And um, several people have shipped Chungus and Bob. Bob has been and, crocheted. And Wendy crocheted Bob's bucket for us. Yeah, exactly. So, <coughs> welcome because, to the wonderful wild world because, of streaming. Because fan art is a glorious, glorious thing. Awesome. Yes. The internet will ship just about anything. Pretty much. <laughs> yes, indeed. But uh, yeah, it's it's a fantastic anthology, and you guys did a, you, you, you folks did an unbelievably good job on it, and I'm just really proud to know you and work with you. Thank you for everything you do. You're amazing. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. Yeah, we wouldn't be doing it without you guys. That's right. Well, I mean... Super proud of the work we do. And, you know, I'm high-fiving you through the internet right now. Internet high-five. 
Uh, to finish off, where can people find you on the online? I'm going to also ask the stream if they have any questions. Oh, yes, real quick. Does anybody have any questions for our amazing <laughs> guests? Well, you can find me on Twitter as at Divius Tweets, and you can find all kinds of information, including most of my short fiction as links on my website, sbdivia.com. And we will put all this in um, the stream notes. Yes, we will. Right. My website, where you can find my other podcasts and my books, is merverse.com. And I am a relatively new streamer. I've been doing it since about July or August. And um, that is twitch.tv slash Mighty Mer. So I do live podcasts and I do some gaming, although I'm about to take a week and a half off gaming, so it'll restart in November. But I do things like How to Boyfriend, the dating, dating pigeons sim, and um, Oxygen Not Included, and Stardew Valley. But I'm thinking about changing things up because I just bought a capture card for my Switch. <gasps> Yeah. One of these says guests. There we there go. We See? Ta da! Okay. Hey. Um, also. How do you. Okay, Mer, when we have our Twitch, yeah. when we have our, our Twitch play dates, we have to talk about capture cards and Switch. Yes, we do. Okay. okay. Make a note. Okay. Um, I was going to say something which is very cool, and it's completely slipped my mind. Yes. Um, what plans do you have for Nano? Are either of you. Planning on doing any streaming for it or anything for it on social media or writing support or anything like that? I'm going to be taking my past. Um, I used to do daily nano podcasts. And um, as I discovered last year, this is one of those things that is blindingly, is, is, excuse me, very obvious. And I should have figured it out really fast. But I found it, it was impossible to do a daily podcast and do NaNoWriMo at the same time. <laughs> So I discovered, uh, I decided to take my reruns because it's pretty much all the same content. It's not, there's nothing, there's nothing new coming out in, in for nano prep or nano performance. So I'm going to take reruns and put them on the podcast feed. And then I'm going to be streaming live write-ins during my usual podcast recording times, which is 1230, uh, Eastern standard time. Yeah, it'll be Eastern standard time by then. Uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I'll be doing live streams. I haven't quite decided how I'm going to do it. I'm probably going to do it via Discord. Cool. But um, yeah, just live write-ins. That's it. Fantastic. Did you Absolutely nothing. <laughs> also an equally valid answer. Uh, no, I was really hoping to get to this uh, novelette or short novella idea that I have been chewing over for a while. But... Um, I tend to be very monogamous with my writing projects, and I am in the middle of revising this far future thing I wrote over the summer, and I really, really want to finish that before starting in on anything else. And I thought I would be finished with it by now, but instead I'm only halfway finished because uh, I have a middle schooler and life. And, and 2020. And tech job. Yeah. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't think I'm going to get to... Nah, no, this year. <laughs> Understand completely. Thank you so much, folks. This has been an absolute absolute delight. I've really enjoyed talking to the, the pair of you on this. Um, we will make sure that we have links to your socials on the Twitch stream, and we also do a big old uh, Twitter thread of show notes after the fact. So your stuff will be linked on there, as will buy links for your books. Uh, speaking of, Divya, I need to talk to you about your next one to see whether there's stuff I could do to help promote that maybe um and awesome. yeah thank you so much and uh yeah. I, I i think we, we will wrap up there have a fantastic day uh, uh and you. um congratulations on the anthology and on being awesome thanks thank you guys thanks for this uh the stream because I, I usually watch. It's very exciting. I knew what Chungus was. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's wonderful to be on it. So thank you, and you know, thank you for running an awesome company that made the Escape Artist uh, Escape Fun Anthology happen. Oh, thank That's you. Correct. Right. Yeah. All right. Why do you tell us being awesome? And you want to let enjoy us your evening. We're gonna step away from yes. It. Yeah. Um. Likewise, we we're gonna step away for a moment, and then we will come back with uh the tonight's installment.